All right, piece of the 12. This is going to be an episode of Rob Reviews. Today we're going to um, review the movie Django Unchained. And we're going to um, basically point out how Django Unchained is basically completely based on Bible prophecy. All right, so let's get into it. All right, so the first scene will be this scene right here where they're walking. All right, this immediately makes me think of the scripture. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's go. Ecclesiastes. All right, 10 to 7. All right, let's get it. This was the scripture I was referring to. All right. This is Ecclesiastes 10 to 7. It says, I have seen serpent, servants on upon horses and princes walking as servants upon the earth. Now, what does that mean? The servants on the horses are the are the uh, are, is Esau, and the princes walking as servants are the Israelites. All right, the servants the the Israelites are in a state of servitude. All right, which goes to Genesis twenty five and twenty three. All right, and the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two men of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. All right, because the way it was set up was the elder, which is Esau, was supposed to serve Jacob. All right, the elder was supposed to serve the younger. But um, due to prophecy, Esau took off the yoke and began to become and began to put the Israelites as servants. All right, and that's what it means in Ecclesiastes 10 and 7 when Solomon states that he has seen servants upon horses and princes walking as servants upon the earth. Once again, how do you know these princes he's speaking of are the Israelites? <clears throat> well, the name Israel literally means prince of power. All right, it means Israel means prince of God. But another word, the, uh, God just means power. So prince of power are the Israelites. All right, so that's how we know. And that's what it's referring to. So that first scene right there is just the beginning. All right. Let's go back to the film. All right, so in this next scene, um, this man's about to ask Django who his name is, and of course, you know, it's Django. So let's get this clip real quick. What's your name? Django. Then you're exactly the one I'm looking for. All right, so notice. He said his name is Django. Well, let's see what the name Django actually means. All right, so right here. <clears throat> this is the name Django is a boy's name of Romani origin, meaning I awake. All right, so the name Django means I awake. And as you know, in this, in this entire film, Django goes through an awakening, which we'll get into. But first, let's get... <clears throat> Let's read Ecclesiastes 7 and 1. All right. This is, a, this is after Django stated his name. Okay. Ecclesiastes 7 and 1. A good name is better than precious ointment and the day of death than the day of one's birth. All right. Then you go to Proverbs 22 and 1. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and love and favor rather than silver and gold. So. And Django was given a good name, all right? In the, in the ancient world, in the Bible specifically, people were given names that were known as omens or nomen omens, meaning a name sign. I'll give you an example. Jacob's name was Surplanter, all right? He was able to surplant his way into becoming um, God's chosen, all right, which was predestinated. I'll give you another example. The name Solomon literally means peace why is that because when solomon was king uh peace was all throughout the land for the israelites all right but anyway that's just an example so Django's name is i awake all right so remember that all right and matter of fact let me get romans 13 and 11 speaking of awake all right romans 13 and 11 and that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. All right. <clears throat> and I got one more. So once again, it's telling him to wake out of sleep. So once again, Genesis 49 and 9. Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey, my son. And by the way, stop right there. Not only is 
uh, Django represented Israelite, he represents a person from the tribe of Judah. All right. Now let's get this again. Genesis 49 and 9. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion. And as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? <clears throat> rouse mean a stir. Or you could also say awaken. Who shall wake him up? All right. Who shall get him up? All right. So once again, that's pertaining to Janko, who's a member of the tribe of Judah, whose name means to awake. All right, so let's get the next let's get the next clip here. All right, so now we're gonna get the next scene. As you can see, uh, look at the attire that Mr. Django is wearing. All right, that in the Bible is known as sackcloth. All right, we're gonna get that in a minute, but let's look, let's let the scene roll a little bit. All right, how they have sackcloth on? As you can see, Django, get up on that horse. Also, if I were you, I'd take that winter coat the dear departed speck left behind. Now watch. That's what's known as sackcloth. I just want to add that in there. Alright. So let's get something. Alright, this is Jeremiah 6 and 26. Speaking of sackcloth, it says, O daughter of my people, gird thee with sackcloth, and wallow thyself in ashes, make thee mourning, as for an only son, most bitter lamentation, for the spoiler shall suddenly come upon us, meaning what? The slaver. The people that are going to put you in slavery. He's telling you to gird yourself in sackcloth and prepare for you to go into servitude. Now let's go and see what sackcloth looks like. One second. I just wanted to show you, this is what sackcloth looks like. All right, hopefully you brothers can see it. All right, so let's get the definition. Another example of sackcloth. Now let's get the definition. All right, it says sackcloth. A very coarse, rough fabric woven from flax or hemp. So it's a rough fabric we just seen. That's what Django had on. All right. Once again, it's a symbol that he's an Israelite. But we're going to get, this is just the basics, man. When I get into the real film, real in deep in the film, you're really going to see it. All right. All right. So next scene. In this scene, the slaves are given a power seat um, to determine what, what to do next. All right. Let's see what happens. <laughs> Let's talk about this. Let's take off the sackcloth. Like I'm not a bad guy. I just, I'm just doing my job. Blueberry, didn't I give you my last apple? Tell you what, boys. Take me to the dock in El Paso. I'm getting you freedom. No, no, please. So notice. When given the when given up when given the uh, chance, they chose, <laughs> you know, to take him out. Now in the scene, Keen shows to uh, gives him a chance to either help this man and you know go back to being slaves, or to take power into their own hands and you know, and you know take him out, which gives me to the scripture I'm about to get. All right, so here we go. When they were given a position of power, they were ready. All right, this is Psalms 110. I'll start at verse 1. All right, it says, A Psalm of David. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at thy right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Which he's speaking to you, who Shai, who, who, who some of you know as Jesus, but you know his real name is Yahweh Shai. But anyway, The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Now watch this. Verse 3, thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of a morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. All right. Verse 5, the Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. But this is what I wanted, man. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. All right. When given the opportunity, when given the power seat to dispose 
of that man. They did it no problem, which made me think of this scripture. All right, now, now, next scene. All right, now remember one of the first things I reviewed. The first thing I reviewed actually was what I have seen servants upon horses and princes, princes walking as servants upon the earth. Now we're going to see this role reversed in the next scene. Here we go. Now Django is on the horse. I'd like you to take two of these tonight, <laughs> and then in the morning, and they on the horse. Well, as you can see, <laughs> now he's turning the heads. Why is that? Because a horse is a symbol of status, a symbol of rulership. All right, that's where you get the term high horse, where they tell you to get off your high horse. You know, a horse is a symbol of status. All right, now that he is on a horse, he is uh, he is above, he's above people. He looks down upon people. All right, that's why everyone is turning their heads, you know. And also in this movie, they said, um, there's a scene in the movie where this man says, don't you know it's illegal? For blacks to ride on horses in, in my county or something along those lines. Why is that? Because once again, that's a show of a high seat, a high status. All right. So next scene. I just wanted to provide some evidence uh, on the things that I stated. All right. It says what? Horses are status symbols. All right. Go down here. Uh, good horses have probably always been a status symbol. In England, it was unabashed symbol of wealth. Once again, it's a symbol of importance. All right. So now, so now he is a prince on the horse, and the people looking down on him are the servants, or at least that's how it's meant to be. Um, that's what's implied in the scene. All right. But anyway, let's go to the next. Let's go to the next uh, clip. Okay, so in this scene, we're going to see um, a common term that is used now and today, known as white guilt. All right, we're going to see what this man has to say, and then we're going to link it up with the Bible. All right, here we go. So for the time being, I'm going to make this slavery malarkey work to my benefit. Still, having said that, I feel guilty. See. He says, he says he's going to, and by the way, this shows you that he's still, a, that Django is still at the level of a servant. That's why he still has on rough clothes, all right? He's still at the level of a servant because, as he said, I'm going to make this slavery thing work to my advantage. But having said that, I feel guilty. See, he has what they call in the world white guilt. All right, now let's get a scripture on that. All right, so this is Ecclesiasticus, also known as Sirach, 41, 4 through 10. All right, now, now this is this is going to play a role, once again, in white guilt, but also in the fate of King Schultz. Oh, let's read Ecclesiasticus 44, or 41 and 4. And why art thou against the pleasure of the Most High? There is no inquisition in the grave, whether I have lived 10 or 100 or 1,000 years. Verse 5. The children of sinners are abominable children, and they that are conversant in the dwelling of the ungodly. The inheritance of sinners, children shall perish. All right, so the children of the sinners shall perish, and their posterity shall have a perpetual approach. Now, this is what I wanted, what he, what he said, complained about him feeling guilty. Verse 7, the children will complain of an ungodly father. Because they shall be reproached for his sake. Woe be unto you ungodly men. Which have forsaken the law of the most high God. For if you increase. It shall be to your destruction. And if you be born. You shall be born to a curse. And if you die. A curse shall be your portion. Alright so I wanted to get all that. But for what it say. The children will complain. Of an ungodly father. What are the children in this case. The children of Esau. Alright. Dr. King Schultz is, an, is, is still an Idumean, all right? He's still from the lineage of Esau, and yet he, he feels guilty. He has what they call white guilt. But notice what it said in uh, this. It said, the inheritance of sinners' children shall perish, all right? That's a foreshadowing to what still ends up happening to Schultz in the movie. 
But anyway, uh, I just wanted to add in on, on that, man. He complains because of his ungodly father. And people can say, what do you mean he's not a child? Understand something. When people are Israelites, they are oftentimes referred to as the children of Israel. All right, so you could also be the children of Esau. You know, meaning if you come from that line, that lineage, you're still a child. You know, you're still a grandson. A great, great grandson of, you know, the patriarch. So I just wanted to add that in there. You know, oh, actually, I can finish this out. And if you be born, you shall be born to a curse. And if you die, a curse shall be your portion. All that are of the earth shall turn to the earth again. So the ungodly shall go from a curse to destruction. All right. So let's get the next scene. All right. Once again, we're on to the next scene. So in this scene, I mean, most of you brothers can already tell watching this what, what scripture I'm about to pull more than likely. But as you can see, Django has a note, a yoke of iron on his neck. All right. As you can see that. So let's let this little bit play out and then I'll get the scripture. Django. Django, Django. Look at what's on his neck. You got sand, Django. Boys got sand. I got no use for a nigger with sand. You see that? I want you to burn around. All right, let's get the next. Let's get the next scripture. All right, this is Deuteronomy twenty-eight, verse forty-eight. It says, "Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things." And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee. All right. And once again, in the screen, in the in the portrait that we just watched in the steel shot, not only did Django have a yoke of iron upon his neck, he also didn't have a shirt on. You know, meaning he was in nakedness. You know, which relates to Deuteronomy twenty-eight and forty-eight. He has a yoke of iron on his neck, and he's in nakedness. All right. Let's get the next clip. So in this scene, it basically signifies um, Django moving up in his in his role, right, in his status role throughout this film. All right, he went from being a slave. Now he's about to play the role of a minstrel. All right, you know. But anyway, let's just let him let's just let him speak on it, and I'll t chime in. And your character is that of the ballet. What that is. That's a fancy word for servant. Now see that? He said a valet. But then he said what? It's a fancy word for a servant. Meaning what? He's still on this on the level of a servant, but he has moved up in his servant status. Alright? So this is the first transition of Django's role in this film. Alright? Valet. <laughs> and now Django. You may choose your character's costume. All right, he told him to choose his costume. Now, it's going to be very interesting what he chooses because, once again, it's going to go back to the Bible. But let's, let's let this little clip play out real quick. He's going to let me pick up my own clothes. Yeah, but of course. His name's Kane. All right, he chose this outfit. All right. I'm going to pause it real quick. Now, this was the outfit that Django decided to go with when he was given permission to choose his own apparel. Now, watch this scripture. Now, pay attention to this, to this, this image. Now, watch this. All right, so now we're going to get the scripture. Now, look at this. All right. It says, which were clothed with blue, captains and rulers, all of them desirable young men, horsemen, Riding upon horses. But what were they clothed with? Blue. And there were horsemen riding upon horses. And they were desirable young men. Meaning handsome young men. Alright. Now, now, now. Doesn't that sound like what we just witnessed? Let's go back to it. Now, doesn't that look like what was stated? I'm going to read it again. Alright. It says, Which were clothed with blue. Captains and rulers. All of them. Desirable young men. 
horsemen riding upon horses. So as you can see, that's directly correlated with the Bible. All right, next scene. Actually, we're still in the same scene. Here's another, here's another verse concerning that blue. All right, this is Exodus 39 and 22. And he made the robe of ephod of woven work, all of blue. So once again, Django is in all blue. Why is that? Because blue is a sign of royalty. All right. And as you know, the Israelites are royal. All right. Let's get, let's get something on that. I think I have something still on this computer real quick. All right. This is a website. All right. It's called artsandculture.com. All right. It says the secret history of the color blue. All right. It says if you're American or European, blue might be your favorite color. You know, it is a long and fascinating history. Oh, wait, can you see it? My bad. All right. From barbarians to royals to workers, blue garments have been worn for thousands of years. All right. But when used as pigment for painting, blue is altogether a different story. It is the rarest and most precious shade of all. All right, so blue has a high status. Blue is a symbol of royalty. All right, let's go, you know, one well, of these images ain't loaded. So I'll pause it. My internet is slow, so the image won't load, but I'll just read what it says. It says, the working class wore brown and green while the kings wore blue. The kings wore blue. Doesn't the scripture say, for you are a nation of kings and priests? All right, this 15th century illumination shows the French kings... Charlemagne and Louis wearing rich robes of ermine fur, blue silk, and gold embroidery. Louis kneels on a blue silk cushion, and even his sword is blue. See that? And by the way, this is a fake image. All right, this is not what Charlemagne looked like. I'll touch on that when I do a video on the Middle Ages. You know, on the so on the so-called blacks who were in the Middle Ages. I'll do a video on that. In the near future. But this is not what Charlemagne looked like. Alright. But anyway. Let's get back to the movie. Alright. So in this scene. There, he's going to mention that Django is a free man. He should not be treated like everyone else. That's because Django represents the elect of Israel. But. At, at the, let's, just, let's just let the scene play. With good taste. He must be treated as an extension of myself. Understood. So. Latina Sugar. Yes. Django. Isn't a slave. Django is a free man, you understand? You can't treat him like any of the other niggas around here because he ain't like any of the other niggas around here. You got it? You won't actually treat him like white folks? No. That's not what I said. <laughs> All right, so once again, Django is on a level now. He's on another level. So he's growing as a character. He went from being a, uh, you know, a slave. Now he's on the level of a valet, you know, but he keeps growing throughout this film. But once again, it is mentioned that Django isn't like everyone else, as that man said. All right. So let me pause it. But he's not on the level of, he's not on the level of Esau yet. All right. Through the, in this film. All right. That's why he said, that's why the, the slave said, so do you want me to treat him like white folks? And he said, no. All right. So Django is um he he hasn't reached his pinnacle yet, so to speak. Alright, but he's on the hill, which gains to the scripture. This is second Ezra six, chapter six and verse eight. Alright, he and he said unto me, From Abraham unto Isaac, when Jacob and Esau were born of him, Jacob's hand held first the hill of Esau. For Esau is the end of the world, and Jacob is the beginning of it that followeth. All right, so Django is on their heels. He's on his horse. He has on his garment. You know, he's already been distinguished from uh, those of his flock around him, you know, because he's the elect and he's on the hill of Esau. That's why when he was going through the town, they looked at him perplexed because they couldn't believe he was on there. Some of them looked frightened, you know, astonished because Django was rising in his um mature in, in his maturation his spiritual maturation all right so let's go to the next scene i'll be back i just wanted to add this scene he's no longer walking with his back hunched and i'll get a scripture for this 
Uh, now he's walking a different type of way. Is the pantry. That's where Big Daddy hang all his dead meat. Polar squirrels. Alright. What you do for your master? See how he's walking? See you hear him take like a slave. So you really free? You see, he says he isn't a slave. Alright, so he's he's in a different status now. He's he's leveling up. Yes, that's true. You mean you want it? Alright, I just wanted to add that. But you see how he was walking. There's a scripture on that. I'll get real quick. All right. This is Ecclesiasticus 19 and 30. It says, A man's attire and excessive laughter and gait, gait meaning walk, show what he is. So the way that he is walking, you can tell that he has more confidence. And his attire, we already would establish, meaning he's royalty. All right. And he doesn't laugh, meaning he's stern because he didn't have excessive laughter. But you can tell a lot from just how someone dresses. For example, if you have somebody that has a red bandana on, you can tell that he's probably a member of the Bloods. Okay? When someone has a badge on, you can tell that he's a police officer. All right? And gait, meaning walk. You can tell when someone's a homosexual by the way that they walk. All right? You can tell that someone uh, has an injury. You know, like if they walk with a limp. So you can tell a lot about how somebody, you know, walks and that what he wears. And if he laughs too much, if he laughs too much, he's probably a clown. All right. So anyway, let's go to the next scripture or let's go to the next scene. Uh, excuse me. Now, in this scene right here, Django is about to mention the Bible. All right. He's going to actually mention the Bible, which once again, why is that? Because it resonates with him. You know, in this little scene right here, real quick. You see what he say? Now the Bible say he was quoting the Bible. All right. So let me pause this real quick. All right. Hopefully this will focus in. Hopefully. If not, I might have to move. There we go. All right. This is Baruch two and thirty. Remember, Django mentioned the Bible. Now let's go to Baruch two and thirty. It says, for I knew that they would not hear me because it is a stiff necked people. But in the land of their captivities, they shall remember themselves and shall know that I am the Lord, their God. For I will give them an heart and ears to hear and they shall praise me in the land of their captivity and think upon my name. For him to mention in the Bible, he means he's thinking of the Bible. He's thinking of the precepts. All right. I just wanted to add that little part. You know, what else does the Bible say? Because Django said. Now the Bible say now what does the Bible say? One thirty Psalms one thirty seven seven. Let's go down here. It says, "Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom, in the day of Jerusalem, who said, Raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof.' So, so this is a prayer saying, you know, telling the heavenly Father to remember the children of Edom, remember the children of Esau, you know, for what they have done, man. You know, and you can read the rest for your own, for yourself on that verse, but." You can see what happens to, to Esau, man. Now let's get to the next verse. All right, so in this next scene here, you're gonna have an I do me and read the scriptures. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna watch this scene a little bit. Then we're gonna see what his reward would be for even opening the Bible. All right. The Lord said, "The fear of me and the dread of ye shall be on every beast of the earth." So he's qu he's quoting the Bible, right? That's what he's doing. <laughs> Let's get a scripture on that. And look at him. He's red in this picture. You know. All right. This is for that so-called white man who's quoting the Bible. All right. This is Psalms 50 and 16 on down. All right. It says, but unto the wicked, God saith, what hast thou to do to declare my statutes? Or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth. And that's what that man was doing. He was quoting scriptures, you know. But it says, what does that to do? How do we know that speaking to Esau? Well, let's keep reading. It says, seeing thou hatest instruction and casteth my words behind thee. That there, that lets you know it's Esau because Esau hated instruction. Why? It told you the elder should serve the younger. Esau was supposed to serve Jacob. And yet here he is, you know, afflicting Jacob. You know, so he's hated instruction. He already hated the instruction that was given to him. 
and he cast out the words behind thee. What else did Esau do? He was told not to marry a Canaanite, and yet he did anyway. All right, reading down, verse 18. It says, When thou sawest the thief, then thou consentedest with him, and hast, seen, hast been a partaker with adulterers. Thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit. All right, this is speaking of Esau, the wicked. All right, now watch here. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother, which is what he was doing in that scene right there. Thou slanderest thine own mother's son. These things hast thou done, and I kept my silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such an one as thyself. Meaning what? The, the Edomite, or Esau, thought that the Most High was on his side. That's why he says what? Uh, thou thoughtest that I was altogether such an one as thyself. Meaning what? They thought that they were the ones that were the chosen ones of the Most High God, Yahweh. All right. But he says what? But I will reprove thee and set them or in, in order before thine eyes. Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. All right. So because this man was quoting the scriptures and, you know, doing and afflicting Jacob, Look at his look at his reward, man. Look what happens to him. All right, let, let me get let me get it. As stated, he's about to get torn in pieces. Let's watch. After he had quoted Bible verses, all right, and then watch his reward. his reward uh, nah. ah. alright so that's good enough next scene the reward alright Obadiah 1 and 15 for the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen as thou hast done it shall be done unto thee thy reward shall return upon thine own head and that's what happened to that man alright <laughs> His, you know, what he had done and happened to him, he got whipped. You know, that man, you know, he, he, he got what was coming. All right, let's get the next verse. Excuse me, let's get the next uh, scene. All right, so after what had just transpired, these people have congregated. And as you can see, these are these are basically clan members. All right, they're, they're Ku Klux Klan. All right, and they're, and they're conspiring. Try to destroy Django. Alright. Now let's now let's get a scripture on that. This is Psalms 83 and verse 3. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, Come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance, for they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee all right and they consulted together on one consent to try to kill Django, man you know and they were and they were destroyed for this that's what they wanted to do anyway let's get the next scene and this next scene is 
a very, very important scene. All right, so pay attention. Now in this scene, this man, Dr. Schultz, is about to explain to him uh, the legend. All right, now mind you, Django's wife, his, her name is Broomhilda. All right, he's going to tell a legend, a story of of about Broomhilda. All right. Now, now pay attention to this story, man, because it's very important. Broomhilda, what's up here? Princess. She was a daughter of Wotan, god of all gods. All right. So, so notice he said what? That Broomhilda was a princess and a daughter of of Wutan, who is the god of gods. Now we're going to get a scripture on that right here. Now watch, this is how you know this is Israel. And as you know, Israel is referred to a lot of times as the daughters of Zion. All right, now watch this. Remember he said that he was a god of gods and she was the daughter of him. Now watch this, this is Deuteronomy 10 and 17. For the Lord your God is God of gods. Isn't that what he just said? And Lord of lords. A great God, a mighty and terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. All right, let's go back to him telling the story. Back to the story. Anyway, her father is really mad at her. What does she do? I can't exactly remember. She, she disobeys him in some way. She disobeys him in some way. That's what he says. Now let's get the next scripture. He said what? That Israel disobeyed. All right. All right. He said that the daughter had disobeyed. Let's get Romans 10 and 21. But to Israel, he saith, all day long, I have stretched forth my hands onto a disobedient and gainsaying people. So we just learned, we just heard him say God of gods. Then he said that Israel disobeyed. Once again, Israel is referred to as a woman multiple times. Let's get that right now. Matter of fact. All right. This is second Ezra 10 and 44. All right, it says, this woman whom thou sawest is Zion. And where is she said unto thee, even she whom thou seest as a city builded? Once you read this chapter, you learn that Ezra had a vision of a woman. All right. And the woman was Israel. All right. And that's what I meant. That's what I'm showing you. Now, notice all this story, because Broomhilda in this movie represents Israel, the daughter of, of Zion. That's what she represents. All right. But let's get another scripture. Proving that the woman is Israel, man. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have testimony of, of Yahweh Shai HaMashiach. All right. Who is ignorantly called Jesus Christ. But once again, the woman is Israel. All right. So that's the woman mentioned twice. All right. And let's go back to the story. I can't exactly remember. She, she disobeys him in some way. So he puts him top of the mountain. Who on the mountain? It's a German legend. There's always going to be a mountain in there somewhere. And he puts a fire-breathing dragon there to guard the mountain. All right, notice he said a fire-breathing dragon. Let's get it. I already got it, but let's get it again. He said there was a dragon that was over her. Now, once again, the scripture, Revelation 12 and 17, I already got it. Let's get it again. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Yahweh Shai Hamashiach. All right, so once again, that's a dragon over the woman. That's just like the story the German was saying. All right, let's go back. And he surrounds her in a circle of hellfire. And there, from Hilda shall remain. Unless a hero arises brave enough to save her. Does a fellow arise? Yes, Django. As a matter of fact, he does. A fellow named Siegfried. All right, so once again, he said, let's a hero come to save her, which ends up happening. Let's get, let's go back to Obadiah. Obadiah 21, all right? And Savior shall come up on Mount Zion. To judge the Mount East, the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. All right. So, by the way, the dragon represents Esau. If you guys didn't know, but what it says, save yours, saviors, plural. What is that speaking about? The 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 King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Yahweh Shai, and His elect. All right. 
There's 144,000. They're coming to judge the Mount of Esau. And notice in the story he said what? That she, that she was on a mountain. Surrounded by a dragon. Alright. And as I said. Um, his wife. Broomhilda represents. Um, the daughters of Zion. And Django represents one of those saviors. You know he represents the elect. One of those saviors. To come and help and come and save Zion. All right. Now, and, and when we get to a part, we're going to realize that Hildy, Broomhilda, Django's wife, she's dressed in gold. But we'll get to that in a second. I'll let him finish the story. See? Quite spectacular, Lisa. He scales the mountain because he's not afraid of it. He slays a dragon because he's not afraid of him. And he walks through hellfire because Brunhilde is worth it. All right, I just wanted to finish the story. So clearly, this is that was a biblical story that they just masked with this Brunhilde tale. Next scene. All right, so now Django is about to move up in status again. He's about to level up. He went from being a slave. To being a valet, you know, which is just a servant. Um, but now, watch, he's going to become in the status of a lawgiver. Let's watch how this transpires. How'd you like to partner up for the winter? What do you mean, partner? You work with me through the winter till the snow melts. I give you a third of my bounties. So we make some money this winter when the snow melts. I'll take you to Greenville myself, and we'll find where they sent your wife. All right, so in this scene, what happened? Now, he is seen as an equal now. He is going to be a partner with this man. All right, so he was his servant, his valet. Now he has come to the, to the maturation of an equal. All right. Um... So let's let's go. Let me let me skip to a quick scene real quick. Now notice his outfit changes again. Now he's in the outfit of a lawman. All right. So let's get the scene real quick. <laughs> his outfit has changed again, and he's seen as an equal. That's why he's standing beside him. Notice notice in the in the earlier. He was in front of him as a valet, a chauffeur. But now he's right beside him. He's leveled up again. You see, I'll pause it right here. Notice. They're side by side. Now they're equals. All right. So he's leveled up again. All right. So he gets into the law business. Now let's get the scripture on that. Remember I told you guys that he represented Judah. Let's go back to Genesis 49 and 9. All right. I mean, remember, he was a lawman. He's in a lawman status now. All right. Genesis 49 and 9. Now he's keeping the law, upholding the law. All right. Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey, my son. Thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couches a lion. And as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? Verse 10. Now, this is the verse I wanted. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver. From between his feet, meaning he will he will be a lawgiver, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. All right, so unto Judah the gathering of the people will be. Of course, this is speaking of Yahweh Shai, but even more so, the tribe of Judah is the leading tribe. All right, which Django represents. Now remember, he's a lawgiver, as we just read. Let's get another scripture: Second Ezra nine and twenty-eight on down. All right. And I opened my mouth and began to talk before the Most High and said, O Lord, thou showest thyself unto us. Thou wast showed unto our fathers in the wilderness, in a place where no man treadeth in a barren place when they came out of Egypt. Now, here we go. And thou spakest, saying, Hear me, O Israel, and mark my words, thou seed of Jacob. Now, watch this. This is what I wanted. Verse 31. For behold, I sow my law in you and it shall bring fruit in you and you shall be honored in it forever all right see once again he represents the law 
all right, upholding the law. All right, he's been up, he's been leveled up to the level of of a law lawgiver. All right, of at least a law upholder, law enforcer, really. But um, let's go to the next next scene. Now we'll play this scene real quick. Now watch. Now notice in this fit in this scene what? Even though they're equals, Django is ahead of him. He's already moving ahead of his partner in this scene. You see? His horse his horse is in the lead. You know? As you can see, I rewind it. Let's see his horse is in the lead. That's symbolic. Alright, now let me let me go to let me go to another scripture. Here we go again, Genesis 25 and 23. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people. And the elder shall serve the younger. All right, now notice, King Schultz is older than Django. And he is he has now said he wants to help Django find his, his wife. Now he wants to serve him on his quest. And also, like I said, Django was in that, in that scene. He was, above, he was ahead of Schultz on his horse. Symbolizing what? That one people is stronger than the other. So on equals, he still has a, he's still um, stronger. All right. That was what that was meant to symbolize. Let's go to the next, let's go to the next scene. Now, throughout the woman, Django keeps seeing visions. Throughout the video, Django keeps seeing visions of this woman, all right, which is his wife. But notice, notice, he keeps having visions, which, we just read was in the Bible. Now this is the first scene where he has the vision. You see that? He sees the woman. Now let's go to the scripture on that. The scripture. Second Ezra 9 and 38. And when I spake these things in my heart, I looked back with mine eyes. And Django just looked back in the scene. And upon the right side, I saw a woman. And behold... She mourned and wept with a loud voice and was much grieved in heart and her clothes were rent and she had ashes upon her head. And verse 2nd Ezra 10 and 27. And looked and behold, the woman appeared unto me no more, but there was a city builded and a larger place showed itself from the foundations. Then was I afraid and cried with a loud voice and said, why is that? Because the woman represents the city. It represents Zion, all right, which is the city in Jerusalem. Right, on a mount, once again. And notice, I'm going to go to another scene eventually. But Django keeps seeing this woman because that's what this woman represents. Alright, now let's go back. Alright, in this scene, Django is basically told that he has to play the role of an actor. He has to act. He has to be someone that he is not. Alright. How much do you know about Mandingo fighting? What? Can you convincingly masquerade as someone who's an expert on Mandingo fighting? Why? Because my character is that of a big money buyer from Dusseldorf here in Greenville to buy my way into... So, he's going to have to play the role of a slaver. Alright, someone he is not. And this immediately made me think of David. Alright, I'm going to go to that scripture. This is 1 Samuel 20, 21 and 10. Alright. Actually, I'm going to start at 12. And David laid up these words in his heart and was so afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. And he changed his behavior before them and feigned himself mad in their hands. Meaning he acted crazy. He had to act as if he was crazy. And scrabbled on the doors of the gate and let his spittle fall down upon his beard. Then said Achish unto his servants, Lo, ye see the man is mad. Wherefore then have you brought him to me? So his so his act was convincing. He acted like he was crazy and it worked. In the same way that Django has to act like he is a slaver. All right? And that goes back to what I'm saying. All throughout these different roles, Django is basically playing a member of the elect. As you know, David is elect. Is elect. 
All right. He plays he plays many elect because he represents an elect member. All right. Um. Let me pause it. All right. Let's get another scripture on that. Matthew ten and sixteen on down. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils. And they will scourge you in their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how what ye shall say or speak. For it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your father which speaketh in you. And Django is about to go into it into the realm of a king. You know, the king of Candyland. And he's gonna to have to, you know, be as wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. You know, not so much as harmless in this scene, but you know. Um But he was delivered up before a governor and a king. I just wanted to add this scripture as well. Alright, now let's get to the next scene. Alright, in this scene. Django comes face to face with his main enemy. What makes you such a Mandingo expert? I'm curious what makes you so curious. As you can see. What did you say, Warren? Alright, let's get a scripture on that. 